This episode is brought to you by cloudpano.com. Adding more revenue to your business is simple. Offer more value. With CloudPano, you can create 360 tours and present them to your clients quickly and efficiently. It only takes five minutes to create a VR tour with cloudpano.com and your clients will be thrilled. You can now avoid monthly fees with their new lifetime license option. For a limited time, you can save $100 on a lifetime license using the code shooting spaces at checkout. Join the movement and join Cloud Pana today. This is Shooting Spaces with Rich Baum and Brian Berkowitz. Welcome to Shooting Spaces, a <laughs> a real estate photography podcast. Uh, okay. Welcome to Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. This is Rich Baum from Sacramento, California. And Brian Berkowitz from New York. Yeah, and welcome to this week's podcast. Uh, Brian, d- tell us, go right into who do we have today? Let's just go right into it. Let's go right into it. We have a guest from in the middle of the country, so I guess we're hitting all, uh, all time zones today. Kerry Burns, who a lot of you might have met at the PFRE conference in November, but he's also very active in the community as well as PFRE. Um, Kerry, why don't you uh, say hello? Introduce yourself. Hey, hi, everybody. I'm, yeah, like Brian said, I'm Kerry Byrne. I'm located in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, I've been shooting real estate and, and stuff for full time for eight years now. And, um, well, the subject of tonight's podcast is about registering your, the importance of registering your, your photos. I've become a strong proponent of pushing this because I feel it's very important to our industry as a whole. Cool. And the reason we, um, we introduced you right away is instead of the, the, t- the normal uh, little banter that Rich and I usually go through is because, um, you know, we all come from different places in this country, myself on the East Coast, Rich on the West Coast, and you kind of right in the middle over there. Um, but, you know, we wanted to kind of get all three of our perspectives as to actually what's going on with uh, this whole um, pandemic that's going on and kind of, you know, see different viewpoints from all different places. And I know, Rich, you know, you just got back, you were out of town for a while and you literally flew flew in this week into a war zone. So what was that? Like? I mean, you were down south. So what was that like for you coming in and not really knowing what to expect out here? Well, I was in for the last 10 days in Southern Baja, California. And um, we we had heard about it. We had known about it, but it wasn't nearly as, as big a thing. We don't really watch television or anything down there. Um, yeah, but we knew something was going to be going on. And uh, my children, uh, I found out, well, we all found out every day was something different, as I'm sure everybody out there is finding out every day is something. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So my kids were uh, are in college, one in Salt Lake City, one in San Diego. And both of them are out of school now. So they, uh, my son actually, my daughter came home a couple of days ago. My son just got home a few minutes ago. And um, so it's a big change, but uh, it's, it's really interesting what's going on and what's going to happen. Um, And I just shot my, uh, shot a couple of homes today. Uh, I had yesterday, I had uh, three or four cancellations. Uh, So it's very interesting to me. Um, it was really weird shooting. I did get to say that uh, I made sure that the, uh, a, the the owners of the house were not in the house, which is uh, I made a joke. All it took was a pandemic to get my wish. No, no, uh, <laughs> no clients in the house, but uh, it was it's not exactly what I'd want. So anyway, um, it, it's going well, and and I'm just you know kind of. I don't want to say I'm ready for the bottom to fall out, but something's going to, it's going to be really crazy times coming up. So I'm just going to kind of chill and, and just take it day by day, you know? Yeah, I think that's all you can do. And, you know, cancellations are to be expected mm-hmm. um, this time, you know, uh, during all this. And, you know, I've had a few and I've actually picked up some shoots because a lot of other photographers aren't shooting. So people have been calling me. So, mm-hmm. um, but like you said, I, I'm kind of setting my parameters when I go into a home and telling the, the agents before, like no one else in the home or if someone it's mandatory that someone has to be there one other person and they cannot be in the same room as me, stuff like that. I'm not touching anything. All those no different- touching, no moving exactly. furniture, yeah. All, not even furniture, but anything. Yeah. I'm not even touching anything. So, um, 
you know, setting those parameters and most of my agents have been okay with it. So it hasn't been mm-hmm. so bad. So, I mean, mm-hmm. here in New York, it's pretty bad. And we're, we're basically on lockdown minus officially being on lockdown. I mean, they don't really want us to go out of the house at all for anything, but you know, we, we got to make money. We got mortgages to pay. So, you know, we're, we're all out there. And I know Carrie, you were telling me, you know, yesterday, I think off the air that it hasn't hit you as much yet, but you see, you see it coming slowly. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. I mean, the uh, well, as of the news tonight, there's only 44 confirmed cases in the entire state of Iowa, so it's it it really hasn't hit that hard here yet. Um, but I am starting seeing um, people, you know, posting and and that you know, open houses are are stopping. Um, and, you know, how showings are, are restricted and stuff. So yeah, it, it's starting to hit here. I haven't had any photographic cancellations yet, but I foresee that happening soon. It's inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if, you know, if you as a photographer are willing to go out and shoot, whether you have some of these parameters or not, I think you can try and get a little creative. Um, I don't know if I told you this, what I, what I did yesterday or two days ago, whatever it was, is I emailed um, the head of marketing on one of the brokers out here on Long Island, the second, the biggest broker. Um, and they have like three or 4,000 agents that work for them. And I told them in an effort to keep everybody homebound and limit showings, I'm offering a 10% discount on Matterport or video walkthroughs just so people can not go out to showings and I'd rather me go there and take care of it with all my parameters than have people doing showings. And they love the idea. They sent it out to all their agents and I got four calls that day. So, you know, you can try to get a little creative also if you're willing to do the work to try and I don't want to say take advantage because that's not my intention at all, but go out and, and try to prevent people from coming home and do, from going out and doing these showings and open houses and give people other options to go out and see the homes other ways. So, yeah, I'm on the same, uh, same thing. I have, uh, I've told all my agents that it might be a good idea to do a 360. I'm going to even throw it in. Uh, I got that idea from Tacey, um, Tacey Youngman. And uh, I'm just going to throw it in because these the, the, the theta cameras, the, the Rico cameras takes me 10 minutes to shoot a house. So I'm just going to throw it in as in goodwill. So what about you, Carrie? You, uh, you gearing up to do any changes or any tips or you might give to, uh, to us out here in, in uh, disaster land? No, I'm not going to do anything different. Um, I don't do any type of video. I don't have Matterport or iGuide or, or the Theta. Um, and I don't plan on getting into it. Um, mm-hmm. I could probably make a few bucks if I would invest in it right now, but it, it's going to be short lived. I, or at least I sure in the hell hope it's going to be short lived. I hear you. Um, all right. So enough uh, depressing talk, I think. Let's get yeah. uh, <laughs> let's get to the matter at hand and why we decided to b- bring you on. And just to give people a little background, there was, um, I think so far he's released two. Um, and he, meaning Mike Boatman, um, released articles on the PFRE about copyright. And has it been two, Kerry, so far? Two, I think, in his series that Three. he's doing. He's oh, three already, I'm sorry, in his series about copyright and the importance and, and the process of going through it and litigation and all that stuff. And in the most recent one, um, he referenced one of your documents in um, pro- properly preparing your images for registration. So I actually went out last week and I registered for the first time ever. Um, I should be embarrassed about that, but I'm, I'm okay saying that. For the first time ever, I registered my images from both 2018 and 2019. So I'm almost all caught up. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. 2008, 2009 is almost all caught up. But while I did that, um, you know, I, I reached out to you because he referenced your stuff, your, uh, your documents. So I knew that you definitely had some experience in this. 
So I reached out to you and said, this is my plan. This is what I'm doing. This is what I did to register. Did I do this correctly? And, um, you know, you told me that everything I did hopefully is, is correct. I haven't got the certification yet, but everything I did looks correct. So then I said, Hey, why don't we have you on and talk about this? Um, because I don't think it's a topic we ever discussed in full, in full depth. And I think it's, it's crucial for people to understand the laws and how the laws protect them and what they can do to protect themselves in the future. So that being said, um, I don't want to go into any, I guess, le legal advice or legalities because that's not what we're doing or that's not what we're here to do. And um, we actually got confirmation earlier today that in a couple of days, we're going to be recording an episode with Rachel Brenke from the Law Tog, who was at PFRE also. So we'll save all the actual legal questions and legal advice to her, um, you know, especially because none of us are attorneys. But um, nevertheless... Um, why don't you start off just giving us a brief explanation of the copyright law and what it says to protect us as artists? Well, it, as content creators, um, we automatically own the copyright to our photos. Um, the moment that they're written to the memory card in the, in the camera. Um, but that protection is only um, or you know, that ownership does not fully protect you. In, in the United States, the only way to fully protect your images is to register them with the United States Copyright Office. That's, that's the only way that you're going to have any um, clout against a, an infringer. Well, that, I mean, that's a very, very valid point to bring up because up until, I guess, a few months ago, or I, I guess probably November during PFRE when Rachel spoke, <clears throat> when I really had, got enlightened to it because I, I think I was definitely uneducated to the way it worked. Um, but I was always in the impression, hey, you hit the shutter button, you take the picture, it's yours. So, you know, if you infringe, sorry, it's my picture. But, and while that is true, um, you know, as you're saying, there's a lot more to it. And if you don't register your images, you're saying you have no leg to stand on. Well, that's true. And, um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate so far in most of the um, infringements that I've gone through that we've been able to negotiate a, a settlement. Um, but just earlier this week, um, I've got an infringement against a, uh, a supplier who, who provides reclaimed woods to the, um, to the building industry, who basically said, F you, we're not gonna even negotiate. Thankfully, the photos are registered, so I'm probably going to end up in, in court over this. You know, it, and if I would not have um, registered those images, then, you know, I wouldn't have a leg to stand on. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to do anything. So, yeah, I mean, this one's probably going to end up in court. So, I mean, I think we'll get to that a little bit later, you know, as far as when it gets to lawsuits and litigation and all that. But if somebody doesn't register their images and they take them and they're infringed, um, are they out of luck? Is it, is it a situation where like, you know, you can take it all you want and you can own the copyright all you want, but if they're not registered, it's, it's pretty much useless or um, without registering? Because... I don't want to. I don't want to assume anything, but I have to guess that a good majority of us, because there's so many of us out there, do not properly register the images. I mean, I think that's a fair assumption in our industry, without um, getting into any numbers that I I don't know about. Um, so, for all these people that have shot that haven't registered their images, if they are infringed, um, is there anything they can do, or that's it? You know, you you can test your luck and see what happens, but good luck with that. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I, if you don't register and you confront the other party, and especially if you go through a, an attorney, an IP attorney, um, you may get a few hundred dollars. 
um, or you may get more than that. But you know, what are you going to do if if the if the infringer infringer says, "Hey, we're not going to negotiate," then you're just going to have to let it let it go, and and the most you're going to be able to do is is uh, um, send a DMCA takedown notice, and that's it, and not be properly compensated for their use of your photos. And I will say that in, in, in I don't know exactly the right, even the right way to say it, but to, in lieu of thinking that to give the other party that's ripping them off credit, most of these people really think they're in the right. They don't really understand it. They don't know. So that's a really tough one when you just are saying something and they're saying something and they think they're right and you know you're right, but you think you're right. So that's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there is a big difference between an innocent infringer and a willful infringer. Oh, true. And, and to be honest with you, I'm only going to go against, um, as far as going to court, going to formal litigation, I'm only going to do that against a willful infringer. If, if I feel it's an, an innocent infringer, I'm going to want compensation for the use of my photos, but I'm not going to pursue it in a court of law. Yeah. You know, and, and really my, my entire goal is, is to <clears throat> get people to change their ways. Um, you know, hopefully the in, innocent infringers I have gone against and I've settled with, you know, they've learned their lesson and it costs them a few bucks. And, um, and now they'll know better. So. Yeah. Well, let me ask you um, if we take a step back a little, because, you know, we spoke about a couple of, if you want to call them misconceptions in our industry um, before we were doing this recording. And I think it's important to discuss a few of them, especially related to real estate photography. And one of them you brought up to me is these are just real estate photos. Do they really have any value? Um, so I think it's important before we even talk about the process of registration and how that works and, you know, how to cover yourself and all, all the, uh, I guess, I don't know if you want to call it technical, but all those aspects of everything. Um, what are your thoughts on the value of what we do, even as real estate photographers, where the shelf life is so short anyway, um, but you know better than anyone that there's actually a lot more value than just the, the three or four months it's going to be on MLS. Oh, very true. And it's, <clears throat> in reality, it, it, it's not our real estate clients who are, who are the infringers? It's the third party aggregators that are infringing our copyrights. And as a result of our photos staying on those sites, there's further downstream infringement occurring. I just recently uh, settled a claim against a, a uh, digital magazine with 2.7 million, I believe, subscribers who took one of my real estate photos and posted it in an article and you know the, the article title was like the McMansion McMansion design sins that makes us want to throw us off off you know the cliff so you know um, it was one photo and um, they in fact, they they got it from Trulia, and um, we just scraped it. it. Scraped it. <laughs> yeah, and um, we just settled that for twenty five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. But this was a photo that was sitting on my hard drive that I took back in twenty seventeen. You know, there was no chance of of relicensing it from anybody, but it still had value to someone. You know, if anybody is willing to pay you for a license to use your photos, and I don't care how experienced you are or how talented you are, 
then your photos have value to somebody. And the chances are it's going to be infringed at one point or another. Yeah, no, no I, I agree. And I, I think people or real estate photographers, especially newer photographers, don't understand the importance of making sure that, you know, they, pro they properly give out usage rights to their images and understand that if other people use them, they can. I mean, I think one of the most popular things in our industry is, is an agent losing the listing and then another agent coming in and using the photos. Um, and I don't know if you have experience. I know a lot of your experience um, with more of the legal side of things is with third party um, infringers. But do you ever come across, you know, I got this call actually uh, about three or four weeks ago, uh, you know, an agent I shot for and the new agent got the listing and she called me and said, I spoke to the original agent A and she told me I can have the photos. Can you send them to me in a Dropbox link? And I said, yes, here's the cost. And she said, well, if I'm going to pay that, I might as well just do a new shoot. And I said, go right ahead. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. that, that's fine. And that, you know, that, that doesn't scare me. Go ahead. So yeah. Do you find that, that that's a big infringement in our industry as far as, uh, or do you face that a lot? No, not that I'm aware of. Um, <laughs> luckily, um, from the time I started, you know, I've had my clients agree to a license agreement and they are well aware that they cannot give the photos to anybody else. And um, it has happened where, um, you know, the new agent has, has used my photos and it's actually the original client who has called me and said, Hey, go after them. So, you know, I can't complain about that. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I know you said it, you, you know, you just said it probably in passing. I didn't realize, but education, uh, you know, you educate your clients and I think that's key because I feel like most real estate agents don't properly understand it. And I think if you just explain to them the way, you know, work, the way it works with commercial photography and they're not, they, these are not, you know, while they're paying you, they're not paying you to own images. They're paying you for your service or your time on site as well as the usage <coughs> license that you're giving them, but that's it. They're not paying you for the images and the ownership of the images. Exactly. You and and I, I'd like to add that I, in my workshops, <coughs> I try and always save a section. I don't really emphasize business as much as, as other people might do, but I emphasize you have an opportunity to get an understanding and clarification with your clients, your agents. And when you're working with an agent, you could possibly have a couple of hours every shoot to talk to them. And it's a perfect opportunity to bring it up, you know, to put that in, pepper that into a conversation. And then, you know, that, that's something that everybody should do. And it just blows my mind how so many agents don't know this. I mean, are you kidding me? When they go to agent school, that's one of the test questions they should have. Who owns the images? But they don't know that. So I like to educate and inform my uh, clients. And it ultimately helps me. Oh, absolutely, Rich. It's, it's imperative. I mean, and in my opinion, that's step one in protecting your intellectual property is educating the client. Yeah. Establishing a written license agreement with that client. And I know a lot of photographers say they don't do it. You know, their clients won't, don't want to go through the hassle. But you don't have to have them sign anything. All you have to do is, is send them your, your pricing, your terms, and your license agreement. And it, in my agreement that I, that I send to all new clients, it has a paragraph that says, by scheduling with us to photograph, a listing of yours, along with the use of the products, signifies that you agree with these terms. I don't need their signature. Mm -hmm. If they go ahead and schedule with me and they use the photos I deliver, I'm covered. 
by accepting, you know, I, you could easily put, just put it in writing on your invoice in small, little type down there by accepting this invoice. You are whatever you want to say, because I don't, I don't, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV, but uh, you know, we'll have Rachel Branke on, on in, in another podcast, but you know, I, I think that it's some, it's definitely not a big deal to get it in there. As you said, it doesn't have to be this, this chain, you know, well, I think a lot of people too, especially the new photographers are scared that they're going to scare off uh, potential clients. And that's part of the downfall, you know, so. Oh, you're absolutely right, Rich. And, and you can put it on the, on the invoice. And, and I do have an abbreviated um, terms on every invoice I send out, but I, but I also feel it's important to have the conversation up first with the client so they, so they understand before you ever even schedule the shoot for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think the important thing for people to realize is while we're shooting real estate and it might not be as, pre as prestigious as other commercial photography um, and our rates are typically significantly lower than other types or other genres of commercial photography, we're still commercial photographers. And given that, you have to treat it as if you're a commercial photographer and that's your business and it has to be run like that despite the rates we're charging and despite, you know, the type of photography we're doing. We are commercial photographers. And, you know, from a commercial photographer standpoint, there's nothing different that we're um, doing from a real estate perspective than somebody else is doing for a Nike ad. You know what I mean? Or shooting for Nike ad. We're, we're all commercial photographers and they protect themselves for their copyrights. So there's no reason that we shouldn't either. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No doubt about it, Brian. Yeah. And because I think also the, the, um, the barrier to entry for real estate photographers is a lot lower. I think people don't give it as much credit as they should um, or think of the business side of things from that aspect. Yeah. So I'd like to, uh, I mean, I don't think we've discussed this. Um, Carrie or Brian, would you like to bring up, because I, I didn't, I wanted to premise this. I don't think we really brought it up at the beginning of the podcast that I think, uh, Carrie, was this something you had been always doing or is, uh, I know that, that uh, we discussed it at the PFRE conference in Vegas in November. That's where the first time I really thought about it or, or somebody had brought it up to me. Um, I'd like to bring up, uh, you know, where, where you heard about this or whatever. And also, what are the steps to doing it? Because one thing I think we found out was it's not that expensive. And Brian, you just did it. So how hard is it? And Carrie, you want to talk about, you know, that end of it. Uh, for people out there going, oh, it's an interesting idea. Tell me more about how I do it. How hard is it? And, you know, stuff like that. Well, I'm sorry for interrupting. Before you even talk about the process of actually registering, Carrie, maybe before we even get to that, talk about how to prepare your images properly locally to then register them. So if there's anything people can do to organize their images before they go through the process, like somebody like Rich, who is not, I don't know if you've registered or not, Rich, but I'm not even going to ask you publicly. <laughs> but um, let's say you want to go and register, but you have thousands of images on your computer, what's the best way for him to organize them and get them all together to then go and register them? Okay, my process, um, it actually starts on importing the images into Lightroom. I re rename the images on import, so it puts the month and year of creation um, at the front of the file number. And then I use the camera sequence number and then followed by the, the customer's initials. This ensures that every photo I register has a unique name, which is a requirement. Um, now, as far as the photos that I register, I don't register every photo I take, every shutter click. I only register the photos that I actually deliver to my clients. Um, and I use a smart, a smart collection within Lightroom to collect all those images. And, and I register every two months, unless I hit the, you know, the maximum number of, 
of photos you can register at a time under the group registration rules is 750. So if I hit 750 before two months is up, then I'll do a registration earlier. Um, and, and yeah, it, it's cheap. It's only $55 for up to 750 photos. Um, now, once, once I'm ready to register, I just simply go to that smart collection and I select all the photos and I export them. Um, I have a copyright export preset, which basically is, doesn't rename the files, uh, sets the um, file size on long edge of 800 pixels at 72 PPI. And that's it. I just export them to a specific folder. You know, and the folder title has the date range of the photos in the collection that I'm going to register. And then there's a, a uh, Excel template that you have to fill out, um, of which there's many different ways of filling it out, but you don't have to manually type in the file names and the titles. It, you know, and you can just, you know, you can create, um, you know, those lists without having to manually type them in. And like Brian, you know, it is far simpler to do that on a Mac than it is a PC. So, yeah, I mean, I, I simply copy and pasted it, literally. I mean, you saw, just to give people just uh, a quick example of how easy this is, and essentially when I registered my images last week, I think I registered about 270 images or so, and I screen recorded the whole process and I actually sent it to Carrie, and I said, this is what I did. Did I do it correctly? And he was like, yeah, you did it right. And I think that whole video was 15, 16 minutes, something like that. So, and I was talking and kind of narrating what I was doing for no reason. But, um, so that being said, it, you know, it, it doesn't take long. That was the first time I ever did it. Um, it's just going to get quicker, especially if my Lightroom catalog is organized in a way to do it beforehand. But yeah, like you said, on a Mac, it's very easy because once you export those images into a folder on your computer, you can just copy, uh, uh, select all those files, you know, copy or Apple C or command C and then go into your Excel spreadsheet, command V, paste them and it'll paste all the file names right in sequential order. So it's pretty quick. Um, you know, there is, a, I learned how to do it on um, the copyright.gov website has a YouTube video on exactly how to do it, which is like 17 minutes long. And it actually took me quicker to actually register them than to follow <laughs> along the video. So, exactly. So, yeah, it is an actual, it's a very, very easy process. And, and as I've told you, Carrie, I'm actually, um, I'm going to get into the habit like you do of, of hopefully registering every quarter. So, you know, we're at the end of March now. So hopefully sometime this week or next week, when I register my 2020 first quarter images, I'll record it and narrate it as well and release it. So people, I guess on a Mac have an idea of the best way to do it and best practices. And, um, I know you released a document and we'll put it in the show notes also of your, um, your workflow and how you prepare the files. But I think when, you know, because you prepare your files on import and I don't, I think it'll be good for people to see two different ways, um, for my images that are ready in, um, in Lightroom. Now I have a different workflow in general, as I've told you about, I, I typically use a different catalog for, every shoot or every couple of shoots. If I'm doing like three or four shoots in, in two or three days, I'll just use the same catalog. So it's a little bit harder for me. But what I've been doing um, the last three months since the beginning of the year is at the end of each job, I export the final deliverable images into a folder I have locally. So what I can do at this point is just create a new catalog with all my final deliverables. And kind of like you said, I can rename all my files, putting the original capture date at the beginning of the file name. So when I'm organizing it later on, it's easier. Oh, right. I mean, in, in, th there's many ways to prepare the documents and get ready for it. Um, you know, your way is different than mine, Brian, but 
and that's partially because of you know different workflows and plus different operating systems too. Mm-hmm. You know, you're on a Mac, I'm on a PC. Um, so and and I know Gary Gomez plans on on um, doing a video on it on you know the way he does it as well. He just recently started registering. Mm-hmm. So I I think it'll be great for for the industry overall, for all of us, just to see the different workflows and in how they, um, how we all, you know, arrive at the same end result. This episode is brought to you by HD Photo Hub. With modern marketing tools for your clients and a powerful back office to help you stay organized and efficient, HD Photo Hub is a secret weapon of successful real estate photographers everywhere. When you register with promo code Shooting Spaces, you'll get a free total marketing kit for your first property. Check them out at hdphotohub.com. HD Photo Hub, where great photos become powerful marketing. That's hdphotohub.com. It's definitely a, a must do for everybody. And like you said, for 55 bucks for 750 images, um, and it only takes you 15, 20 minutes if you set yourself up properly from the beginning. I mean, now, unfortunately, a lot of people might have to play catch up, but once they're caught up, you know, if you set yourself up and if it's 15 minutes every few months for $55, there's, I feel like there's no reason not to do it. You know, you're, you're just, you know, if you get infringed, you're going to kick yourself in the ass one day and say, why didn't I spend the 15 minutes to do this? Oh, ex- exactly. And <clears throat> Well, last year I did seven registrations total and I registered over 4,700 photos and it cost me 360 bucks. Well, the one case that I just settled um, far more than covered that cost of my registration fee, you know, so to me, it's a no-brainer. I mean, it's so simple. It's cheap, and 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 for the people who say they can't afford it or or whatever, you know, I mean, you can't afford not to do it. Yeah, is is eight cents per photo too much to pay for the additional insurance and benefits that you will receive by by going through the registration? I mean, I look at it as insurance. I mean, we all have insurance for our cars, our homes, our gear, our liability insurance. And I just look at it as insurance for my photos. Yeah. Let me ask you, let me ask you a question. Um, so let's just say you get somebody that wants to play hardball with you. Did you, do you tell them that, do you have an, an added benefit where you can just tell them, okay, by the way, that image you've taken from me is is copyrighted with so and so blah blah blah. Is there something there that you could say or send them which will help them to go? Oh boy, if I'm going to go down this road, I've really got to be ready. You know what I mean? Is this a, you got some ammunition there? Well, every everything I pursue, Rich, I go through an attorney. He's okay. making the demand letters. Um, and corresponding with, you know, with the infringer or the infringer's attorney. Um, so, yeah, I generally, I do not contact infringers myself. In fact, I highly suggest that nobody does that uh, because, you know, it, let's say, a, a, you know, a home you photographed, um, a local interior designer takes those photos. So if you contact that inter- interior designer and say, you know, hey, you know, you don't have a license for those. I'll tell you what, I'll license them to you for fifty dollars a photo. You know, well, you set a price. Well, if they turn around and say screw you, and you have to take them to court, you've already established a value of your photos and that could come back to haunt you if you end up in a court of law but i i will caveat that that to say that um 98 probably at least 98 percent 
of infringement actions do not end up in formal litigation. They are negotiated and settled long before that. But why take the chance to limit the amount that you can recover? Sure, and I feel like if you, you know, if you do this stuff properly and register your image properly and an infringer knows that, they don't want to go to litigation with you because it's going to cost them a hell of a lot more than a settlement will. So, Oh, absolutely. And um, I've been told that if an infringer hires an IP attorney to fight it, up front, it's going to cost them at least $15,000 to get that attorney on retainer. That's a minimum. And, and I know a lot of people say that, you know, in infringement cases, the only people that make money are the lawyers. And that's not true. If you go through and you, you enter into a rights managed license agreement with your clients and you properly register your images, then there are plenty of attorneys out there that will take your case on contingency. And typically, contingency fees are around 33% of the total recovered. So, you know, sure, I'm paying him 33%, but I'm getting 66%. So, you know, the lawyers don't make the most mm -hmm. in most cases. So let me ask you, if you're browsing the web and you come across or somebody lets you know that you come across images of yours that were infringed. What's typically the first step that someone should do? I mean, is the first thing you might be different than somebody else because you have everything properly registered, but for people that are, you know, just considering maybe starting to register their images or people who have not, or even people who are, you know, more advanced like you, what, what's the first step? Is the first step to email, email them and say, because I've done this in the past. I've emailed them and say, hey, you're not licensed to use this picture. Take it down immediately. Or is the first step, contact your attorney, don't even get involved. Or, uh, you know, what advice can you offer in that regard? Well, I think you have to look at who the infringer is. I mean, if it's, um, if it's somebody in your local market and going after them could be detrimental to your business because of word of mouth or whatever, then you're going to have to tread lightly and you're going to have to evaluate, um, you know, what's, what's best for my business or myself long term. Um, but if, if it's, you know, definitely if it's an infringer that's not in your area, then the first thing I'm going to do is contact my lawyer. And, and just let him handle it. Now, if you haven't registered your images, you can send a letter or, or an email or whatever to the infringer and say, hey, you know, like you said, Brian, you know, you haven't paid for a license to use them. Would you like to, to properly license them or are you willing to take them down? And um, that may be the best bet. I mean, if, <clears throat> you know, in my opinion, or the way I look at it, I have to look at what's possible to happen. I mean, any anybody could say, screw you, sue me. So if, if, if you don't have your ducks in a row and have your, light, your images registered, then, and they say, screw you, sue me, ba basically you're limited to just sending a, a DMCA takedown notice. Because number one, you cannot file a lawsuit for infringement without having a registration certificate. And if the registration was not timely, in other words, if the infringement happened before you actually registered the photos, then you're limited to actual damages and not statutory fees and legal costs. So, you know, if you're shooting real estate and you're getting 25 bucks a photo, you know, is that your actual damages? 
Yeah, which is not even going to pay for the filing fee to go to federal court. Now, does that change um, for online or social media or Instagram? Because, you know, Instagram is probably one of the biggest, not Instagram themselves, but people infringing using Instagram is probably one of the biggest um, platforms out there that people infringe. I've had it all uh, a lot. And um, I've had... I've had it handled different ways. You know, the few people that have done it for me, I, I've, email, I've emailed them. And there, there's three cases that come to mind personally um, where it's happened. And, you know, there's one, one specific one where, you know, the guy just took offense to the fact that I emailed him and called me the copyright police and just went AWOL on me, um, to which point I just had Instagram take it down, which was fine. They took it down right away. Um, but then there's two other situations where I've actually turned it into a positive. And, you know, one person posted something that I shot for a designer. It was a cabinet company. And now they're a client of mine and I shot three shoots for them on top of them licensing $2,500 worth of images for me. So, um, you know, there's, I guess, different ways to tackle it with social media, but, you know, with something like that, is, is that something you would go to an attorney also and just say, hey, handle this? Or is it a little, are you a little more lenient with like social media or web or online where you might say, hey, you know, you're really not supposed to do this. Do you mind removing it? Well, I, again, I think it comes back to, um, to who's infringing. It sounds like to me that the company is is probably local to you, Brian. Uh, fairly local, yeah. Someone? Yeah. Um, of which then you, you may have to tread lightly, you know, just not to, you know, damage your business. Um, and you probably did the right thing. I actually had um, a case where a, a local interior designer used – my images and, and post them to their house account. And, um, and I happened to run across it because I found an, another infringement. Um, and um, since they were local to me, I, I sent them an email, you know, and, and, and worked it out between the two of us. I wish they paid the license fee. Um, so yeah, I, Every case is different, and I, I mean, it, if it's local to me and it has potential to um, hurt my business, then I'm more likely to reach out to them. Um, but if it's a, well, for instance, I had an interior designer, like you all know, I'm, I'm based in Des Moines, Iowa. I had an interior designer take one of my real estate photos and post it on her on her website and she's based in Dallas, Texas. You know, there's no way in hell she had anything to do with the project or anything else. So, you know, I contact a lawyer and we settled. So, you know, it, there, there's another company or a blogger. In, in fact, if any, if anybody listening to this, if, if they photographed older homes or whatever, you know, around 100 years old or, or older, um, look up the old house, the old house life. Um, I can guarantee you, you, you'll find your images there. I've got a, a case going on right now against her that we're in negotiations with. Um, you know, you you're going to be surprised at, at where your photos are being used. Yeah, interesting. And also just to take the other side of things too, and this is something that we um, went over in our webinar with Adam Taylor, as far as licensing is, you know, once your images are registered properly too, I feel like it gives you an outlet to go and pursue other options to try and license your images and make a, make additional income that way too. Whereas you're not only looking for infringers, but you're also looking for people to purchase. Um, you know, just to use an example, you know, I shot a, um, a project, a local, uh, I guess it's a retail space here, where it was a cost sharing between the, the store owner, the interior designer, and the, um, 
and the appliance manufacturer sub uh, sub zero wolf actually chipped in for for license as well and um the designer used a company called barn lights to you for the lighting in the place and the designer posted it and this company barn lights commented oh you know this place came out great so i reached out to barn lights and i said hey if you like this image here's the whole gallery if you're interested in licensing in any of them let me know and then they emailed me back three days later after looking through my Instagram feed and sent me four other shoots that had their lights in them. And they said, can you send me the galleries from these shoots also? We're interested in others as well. <laughs> Good so, job, Brian. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I look, part of that's a, just a stroke of luck. You know, I didn't even know that, that, that my other houses had these um, lights in them. So it, it was honestly a stroke of luck. But the fact of the matter is, you know, because I know these images are registered properly um, as of two weeks ago, <laughs> um, you know, I was able to go out and pursue them and say, Hey, you know, like I shot these, are you interested in these, you know, you don't have that many professional pictures on your, on your Instagram or your website, you're interested in taking these. And now I'm negotiating a deal for different shots from five different shoots I've done over the, the two or three years. Some of them literally as early as 2016 that I didn't even know included their lights, but literally they, they found, these images on my Instagram feed and said, can you send me these galleries too? We might be interested in some from those as well. So. Sounds like I need to start using Instagram more. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of business out there on Instagram. <laughs> Trust me. I've, I've, uh, it's been very, Instagram been very good to me. So. Is that right? Yeah. Well, at the end um, of 2018, Rich's goal, he said for my goal for 2019 was to uh, boost my Instagram. Yeah. Was that right? And uh, yeah, I got, I got 4,000 uh, followers. I've re uh, recently done two shoots for people that uh, just were, I don't know. I should ask them what they were searching for. Um, but local, uh, local builders uh, called me, called me cold. And uh, they said, Hey, we like your stuff. Let's uh, we want you to shoot for us. So it's been good for me. Yeah. I got to get some Instagram advice from you, Rich. Okay. I got plenty of time now to, to give you a lot of in information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got time to make uh, new YouTube videos. I've been very lax. haven't made a video in four months, but I, uh, I just got back from Mexico. I made a bunch of videos down in Mexico and I got a whole bunch of time now to do podcasts, Facebook lives, YouTube channel, all this stuff, man, and register my photos with the copyright office, right, Kerry? I hope you do, Rich. And I will. The hand, you let me know. Uh, in fact, I I want to offer that to the entire, you know, anybody who's who's watching this. If if you want more information or you want assistance in in registering your your photos, please reach out to me. I am more than willing to help in any way I can. I don't think you know what you just signed up for. <laughs> I, I, I think I do. Yeah, I, no, I'm just kidding but, around. You, you know, especially, I don't know about your area, Rich, but, you know, I see it mostly coming from California where these MLSs are trying to, to um, you know, grab copyrights and stuff. And, and I got to say, if we don't start doing our due diligence um we're we're probably going to lose this industry as far as having any rights to our photos so we we need as many photographers as possible to start registering so that we can stop this rights grab that's going on in our industry and it's more prevalent in our industry than i think any other industry mainly because of the third party aggregators and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, we can stop this. We just got to commit to, to doing our due diligence. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Well, well said. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, cool. Well, we're running low on time, but Carrie, I want to thank you for coming on and just shedding a little insight as to the process and the importance. And, you know, we're going to get into this even more in depth, I guess, in a week or two when we release the Rachel interview. And, you know, she'll, she's going to speak a little bit differently, not probably not about the, the, 
tech, you know, the process, I should say, of, of registering your images, but more about the, the legal side of things and, and going to litigation and the way the law works and why the law is there to protect us and stuff like that. So that's going to be an interesting conversation, which we're going to release in the next one to two weeks. But I think um, this was enlightening for people to hopefully convince them the importance of registering their images and, and if so, how to, uh, if they find infringers, how to go about that process of, of starting something and, and doing it properly. And, and, you know, the importance of people understanding the proper value and what they're doing. So, Exactly. And, and the other thing, um, if I can add, Brian, is, is, you know, I hear a lot of, people saying that I don't have time to look for these infringements. You know, there's many services out there that you can upload your photos to and they'll do the searching for you and will notify you when they find, you know, Infinite. uses of your photos. I mean, there's, there's Pixies, Pixie, Image Rights, Image Defenders, Permission Machine, and and many others, you know, so you don't, it's not as if you have to sit at your computer and do, you know, and start looking for your images. There's services out there and they're all different. They got different terms and everything, but they'll do all the searching for you and they'll send you a report once a week or once every two weeks, whatever, of the, or the, of the uses of your photos that they find. So, you know, it, even that part is not labor intensive. I mean, every virtually every infringement that I have found was brought to my attention through one of those um, image search services. And they work well, you know, surprisingly. Um, you know, after I registered my photos last uh, two weeks ago, whatever it was, a week and a half ago, I signed up for one of the services and uploaded a ton of photos and the next day I had a literally a list of images I had to go through and say, did you authorize this? Did you authorize this? Yes or no. Um, and everything that came back, knock on wood for now, came back authorized. So I didn't have anything that they found, but um, maybe part of me hopes they do so I can make some money. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, it'll definitely happen, Brian. You'll yeah. find them. All right, cool. So again, thanks, Kerry, for um, coming on. Do you want to, you know, give a little plug to your website or anywhere else you have stuff online that people can see? Or you? Oh, come on, Kerry. What's your website? My website is prep Iowa p r e p i o w a dot com, and really, that's the only place I post photos. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So um, again, thanks for coming on. I am sure I'm confident some people will reach out to you just for some help and guidance. And, you know, hopefully you'll share those stories with us of people that reach out to you for some help registering your images and, you know, definitely put it out there. And, you know, I know you're active in on PFRE, especially with uh, Mike Bowman's articles. So I want to highly encourage anybody that hasn't read that series. There's three parts. I'm not sure if there's going to be more. I gather there's going to be some more articles in his series. I, I believe Mike's working on one more at this time. So it's a great, it's a great series and it just kind of puts things in perspective. So I think people should definitely go out and, and read. It's a bit long, but still worth, um, you know, even a long PFRE article is 10, 15 minutes. So you're not talking about a significant amount of time. Um, so Actually his, his first post as um, you're going to spend more time reading all the responses. The comments. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it, uh, from what Tony told me, it's it set the record for the number of responses on the blog. Oh, interesting. Yeah, look, you know what? He, he's got a lot to say, and he definitely puts it in perspective for people. He did for me, and I went out and I registered my images and, and started this whole process. And now I just have to make sure I kind of get myself onto this sustained schedule of quarterly so I don't have to play catch-up like I did. So, Well... I'll start sending you texts. That's fine. No Bye. problem. I would love that. And I'll get on board too. Uh, you got my word about it. Word for it. It's absolutely great. That's good, well, Thank you. Thank you so much, Kerry, for coming on. And again, that's Kerry Byrne from uh, Ohio. And, Iowa. Uh, Iowa. Ohio. Iowa. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. I got your last name right, but I, uh, I screwed up the, the state. <laughs> so I apologize. 
But uh, Brian, why don't you uh, take us out of here? Uh, no. So again, thanks, Carrie. And we're going to put in the mm-hmm. show notes the uh, a link to the document that Carrie provided for us with his workflow on how he prepares his images in Lightroom on a PC for registration. And hopefully, you know, I'll come out with a video soon on how to do that. And Carrie, you said you might do a video, and Gary said he might do a video. So hopefully, there'll be enough assets out there for people to figure out the best way and what workflow works for them and, and do this properly and get it done. Um, but with that, um, I want to just remind everyone, ask the guys, send them in. Oh, and we have our webinar. We're, th- we're two days away. Two days away mm-hmm. from our webinar, Rich. We, we didn't even talk about that. Editing with Rich Baum. It's going to be an exciting night. Yeah, it's going to be uh, all my hits. Uh, let the ambient do the heavy lifting and uh, uh, maybe some twilight editing and it'd be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. And everybody seems to have a lot of extra time right now for uh, education. So Yeah, I mean, is... that, look, we're all stuck at home. So what's what better <laughs> to do with your time than to go learn and, and you know, get your techniques improved. So when you go out and shoot, hopefully in a few weeks uh, or less, Mm -hmm. um, you're back at it. And, you know, obviously we know money's tight for everyone now, but you know, this webinar is 29.95. So for 30 bucks, the the type of uh, education you're going to get for, we're we're looking at what a a one and a half, two hours, Rich, the type of education Mm -hmm. you're going to get for, for one and a half to two hours of hands-on learning and editing with Rich, being able to ask questions, having Rich's original source file. And I know Rich, you put a lot of work into this, so it's going to be an exciting night. Um, it's going to be fun. So I don't want to guarantee at the time of this release, we still have openings, but I think we should still have a few left. So go to shootingspaces.net slash editing if you're interested in participating in the webinar. Um, again, shootingspaces.net slash editing. And um, with that, what else do we have? Ask the guys. Send some ask the guys. You can always use some yeah. of those. I think we got a couple of qu- our last week's question from Holt Webb. I think we have like three or four more from him. He he sent us a bunch at one shot. So unless we unless we get some more questions from people, Holt Holt Webb is going to be uh, taking over our uh, airwaves. So uh, definitely send those in on our website or you know record it on your phone and send it in to us. Whatever works for you. Whatever the easiest way to get those to us is yeah. and. Uh, and subscribe to uh, Shooting Spaces podcast, and uh, you know check out our uh, Shooting Spaces dot net for uh, articles and all the kind of stuff. So good stuff, man! And uh, stuff. again, thank you so much, Kerry. Yeah, and just oh, thanks wanna, for having me, guys. Been in the time. Yeah, yeah. just want to just wish everyone the best. Stay safe. Enjoy the time with the family because uh, you know when we're all back to hustling, we're going to say, "Oh, we miss the." Uh, spending a couple of weeks at home with the family, but most importantly, stay safe and stay home and let's, uh, let's get through this. Go out and shoot some spaces. Okay. In a few weeks. In a few weeks. Ready to step in front of your competition? Invest in the IMS5 camera system and offer your real estate clients an all-in-one property listing package. It supports video, drone, and still image capture as well. With iGUIDE, your real estate photography business becomes a complete real estate marketing service without having to change your workflow. Visit goiguide.com and enter promo code SSWINTER2020 in the reference number section to get your first three standard iGUIDES free when you purchase the iGUIDE IMS 5 camera system. This has been Shooting Spaces. For more episodes, visit shootingspacespodcast.com and visit our education site at shootingspaces.net.